In the early part of the 20th century, there were no less than five blacksmith shops in Crowland. As late as the 1950s, two were still operating. Clark's was one, and the other was Bailey's in West Street. Frank Clark worked here in North Street into his 80s and until shortly before he died in March 1994. This film is my very inadequate tribute to a man known and loved by many and who was, so far as Crowland is concerned, the last blacksmith. Bailey's Forge stood behind the George and Angel public house on the site of Crowland Auto Body Repair Shop. In South Street, there were two. Gray's, here seen in two photographs taken about 1920. And Jack Wardale's yard behind what is now the florist shop. In North Street, about 200 yards south of Clark's shop, was Copeland's Forge, next door to the Eberson's cottage. But the last, and still working into the 1990s, was Frank Clark's. Today, with tractors, harvesters and all kinds of machinery on the farm, the horse has all but gone. But in the first half of the century, there would have been horses to shoe. Cart furnishings to manufacture and keep in good repair. and wheels to be shod with steel tires. Iron railings and gates would have been more common than they are now, and all would no doubt have been produced by the local blacksmith. There is some doubt about the year when Crowland's last windmill burned to the ground but it's believed to have been about 1911 or 1913. Before that time, there would have been a great deal of ironwork in the gears and axles. They would no doubt also have been maintained by our local blacksmiths. This photograph shows Frank Clark's shop in about 1902, with Mr. Favag and his two daughters standing out front. Today, the cottage is empty. The forge door closed and locked. And the forge itself, silent and cold.
In August of 1993, I filmed Frank working in his forge and a short interview with him in the parlour of his cottage. It was only about 20 minutes, but I reproduce it here now in Frank's memory. Now yeah, then, you're welcome. Tell me something of the history of this forge. How long has this forge been here in North Street? Oh uh, dear. This forge, I've got a photograph of this forge from 1902 with Mr. Favag and his two daughters standing out the front, which you see in that picture what I showed you. That was in 1902. Yeah. And, and after then, Mr. Fletcher bought the shop. And I just don't know what year my father come down to this place. I'm really sure. I don't know what what date it was when my father come to this shop, mm. and he used to lodge with Mrs. Slater, Mrs. Stimson, has lived in that house where Tony lives. Mm. He lodged with them, mm. and he come from Market Arbor. Right. My father come from Market Arbor down to Crowland, yeah. and he had a friend from the same place. He come from Little. He went to Littleworth as a blacksmith. Yeah. And uh, what am I trying to say now? It was nothing for us when we was kids at school to walk to Littleworth after we'd been to church on Sunday nights to see my father's friend. We walk there and walk back. And they used to do the same, you know, during the summertime, when it was light and what, they would come over here and visit us when we was kids. Yeah. Were you apprenticed under your father? Well, yes and no. I started to work on the farm. I started to work on the farm before I started to work here because Mr. Fletcher has owned the shop when my father worked for, he didn't want anybody. I was already started when I was 14, you see, but I think I must have been 23. I must have been 23 before I started here. And I've been in here over 50 years. And still working when the, I'm still when the need arises. <laughs>
to whoop it now. To the point, I'm talking about being strict. It was no use you going in that shop on Monday morning with dirty shoes. Because if you did, he sent you and he said, well, I think the first job you better do is go home and clean your shoes. <laughs> that was Mr. That was Mr. Fletcher. But I never worked for Mr. Fletcher. I worked for me. My father took over. After Mr. Fletcher retired, my father took over, you see, that's how I come to be here. But I knew that before I started here, because your father also used to say, well, clean shoes every Monday morning. So I never started with dirty shoes at all. Monday morning, when I started here, shoes were clean. That was all right. But if you didn't, well, you only done it once, did you? That's right. You only done it once, yeah. you know very well if you come a second time, where well, you'd got to go. That's right. I mean, they start at seven o'clock in the morning. And there's every hour making shoes in the winter time. Horse shoes. Horse shoes. Making horse shoes in the winter time. Mm. That was before, but from seven until eight o'clock. Then you'd go home half hour for your breakfast. Then you'd come back and start your ordinary manual work, you know, making different things like them arrows and all different things for carts, the carpenters, they wanted long bolts making for carts and all different shaft irons making for the carts and that sort of thing and that's the sort of work, uh, you know, we used to do. But, you know, if there are two horses come along, well, you just show the horses. Yeah. What? Time of night would you expect to finish then? We'd have a dinner at uh, one o'clock yeah. for an hour. That's why two o'clock. Then you'd work until five o'clock for your tea. Half an hour. You'd come back here again at night. While seven, up seven at night, making horseshoes again in the winter time. So you'd got a good stock of horseshoes for this time, of, for this time of the year. Because you didn't want to be making all shoes when the sun's fit to scorch your eyes out. You always make them when the snow was blowing, when it was freezing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as for shoeing cartwheels and that sort of thing, we used to do, we used to get up and do four of them before seven o'clock in the morning, before we started a normal day's work. We'd get up and shoe four of them wheels. I'd about take you two hours. I'm starting to light the fire up and getting all the tires on. Had to take you a good two hours, two hours and a half. Yeah. So that would have been a five o'clock start? Ah, oh, yeah, perhaps before then, up before, yeah. It just all depends how you got on. But that's what it was this time of year, you know. And then uh, after then, this time of year, you, well, I would. I don't remember ever doing anything on these old-fashioned reapers, what they had. But I've got a photo of one in the back there, what was being repaired by my father and Mr Fletcher. The old-fashioned reaper with her four arms on. Oh, it's Barbara, I think. Perhaps about 50 or 60 of these made when the blokes worked on the farm with their horses. They'd want to come in half a dozen four slings 
But to tell him, he would have a man who come boys that come and tell him when they go. I mean, that just wouldn't be one of them. I'll be two or three of them come. We should be repairing binders and yeah. grass cutters and hay tunners and all that sort of thing, you see, this time of the year. Mm. Yeah. If somebody broke down in the field with a binder or a hay tunner or anything like that, you used to go out into the fields and uh, mend it for them. Yeah. yeah, you used to go out there and mend it but for there them. there was enough work in those days for four. There was sense. enough room. I think there was four at Mr Bailey's. I think there was four working there and sometimes five because they used to employ a odd job one sometimes this time of year because there was, there was four of them. There were four regular them, four. And then there was two in the shop where the shoe shop is, two blacksmiths there, father and son. And this one just up the street here where Morris is. Yeah. There was two in there, father and son. And then um, I'm just trying to think, uh, it had to be 19th, Oh, I think it'd be 1936, sort of thing, before I... 1935, 36, before I sort of started here. Yeah. So that's that's still near on 60 years ago. Well, there you are, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah 35, 36. Before I started here, I used to go to work on the farm all day and then come home at night and have my tea and then come back here while seven and eight o'clock at night and help my father when he was on his own. Yeah, I used to come back here and then help him out, like that, until I said, well, eventually, I'm either got to have one job, else the other. Do you like coffee, aren't you? So, Not for me, love, thanks sure. yeah. Yes, mate, yeah. yeah. And, uh, hello, I said yes, didn't you hear me? <laughs> yeah, well, you ain't looking at me. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I see now. <laughs> but in the early days, there would have been a lot of work because of the number of horses. Yes. Oh. As, as the horse declined, yeah. what sort of work were you doing as a blacksmith? Well, we used to make drawbars for carts. You know, when they started having tractors and that, mm. we used to make drawbars for carts. And, and all these four-wheeled trollers, we used to make the drawbars and all that sort of thing for them. Yeah, that's what we used to do, and um, I've, we did have the settling welder before my father died. We did go in for a settling welder before my father died, and I think we had one electric drill mm. when my father died. <laughs> we thought we was in clover when we got our first electric drill, but now you see, You've got electric welders. I had a Lincoln, that's the first, a Lincoln weld generating one. The first one I had, it was a generator. I've still got it anyway. And then from there, but I don't know really why I bought this last one that big one. That's the Lincoln. But I've always fancied one, and I've got the money, I thought, oh, blast it. I'll treat myself to a play thing. <laughs> treat myself to a play thing. Why not? Why not? <laughs> and that's how it sort you know, sort of come about. But there was no electric, there was nothing and everything was done by the hands. 
How, how long ago is it since you actually shut the forge down and retired? Well, I've not actually shut it down. If I'm just done the marrows this year. Yeah. I've just done the straighten them all up. And so you're not them. retired then? Well, now not yet, really. Not, not really. <laughs> I don't think you ever will, Frank. I was, no, I was you to ask him how old he's going to live to, are you? Oh, I know how old he's going to live to. If he can't find the way he's going, it'll be under 50. He won't make it if he's got nothing to do with it, if he gets that countdown crust. No. I shall keep myself fit while I can. That's right. That's and right. when I can't, You're I'm going to accept it, ain't I? That's right. 